Okay. Uh, so today, um, I guess before we kind of jump into things, I'll uh, start grading um, that fourth Excel assignment. So you should start seeing those grades up there. I'm, I'm not quite all the way through um, your section. So hopefully either by the end of the day today or for sure tomorrow, I'll have all those graded. Uh, I'll get your um, kind of scores uh, up there on Canvas to, to kind of incorporate that, that fourth Excel assignment. Once the fifth Excel assignment is turned in on Friday, I will get those graded um, hopefully pretty quickly and then drop the lowest of every single type of homework and get those grade reflect, grades reflected on Canvas as well before you have to take that final. Okay. So um, last class, I think we went through practice exam A. Uh, I also posted a video and announcement. In the other section, I went through practice exam B, so I posted that uh, on our YouTube page as well. So you should have me working through the first eight questions on each practice exam, which is kind of the old, you know, the two, high, two population hypothesis testing stuff and confidence intervals. Today, we'll kind of mainly focus on linear regression questions. I also posted an additional kind of file up there in the final um, exam practice materials, which is just more questions of, on, on linear regression that gives us some more stuff to work through today, but also um, on Friday as well. So unless there's specific questions on either practice exam um, on kind of the hypothesis testing problems, I'll, I'll start on the linear regression. So if there's any specific questions, I can start on those. If there's not, then I'll just kind of jump into the linear regression questions. Okay. All right. So um, on practice exam A, We'll kind of look at this regression output. There's only a couple questions, but I'll work through some additional questions I could ask as well. So we've got some multiple regression output here from Excel. I kind of tell you up here that the dependent variable is wage. So when we see this word dependent, right, we should think about this variable depends on all these other variables that we've included on the right hand side. So it's our Y variable. So we can kind of think about the dependent variable is our Y or our left-hand side variable. So wage is measured in dollars per hour. So we've got the units of that Y variable. The X variables are our independent variables, the ones in which we're trying to use to explain or predict Y are kind of listed below. So we've got education, experience, and age all measured in years. And then we have this gender variable, which is one if the individual is male, zero if they're not. Okay. So we've got this regression output here. Um, I've kind of blanked out what the test statistics are, right? So you can't observe those. Um, however, if you were to kind of select on this blank space and move it, we can kind of see what those test statistics would be. But some of the questions like number 10 here might be, what is the test statistic for a specific variable? So remember this regression output, let me zoom in here just a little bit. Right. Each one of these coefficients is the estimate essentially for an equation that we did that looks like this. So uh, education plus B2 times experience plus B3 times age plus B4 times gender. Right. So we've obtained the estimates for the intercept and each one of these coefficients or these slope coefficients. So I'll kind of jump to, to problem 10 here first. If we wanted to calculate those test statistics, all we have to do, and if we go to our formula sheet, right, we've got that the test statistic for a coefficient is simply that coefficient estimate divided by its standard error. It's as easy as that. So these questions hopefully should be really easy points. So if I wanted the age test statistic, I would simply take that coefficient of negative 0 0.019 divided by 0 0.083, which should give me, uh, actually, yeah, it should give me this negative 0.229 if I do that. Right? So it's just the coefficient divided by the standard error. And we can see that for each one of these coefficients, I could ask you to find the test statistic. So 1.23 divided by 3.67 would give you 3.35. 0.41 divided by 0.14 gives you 2.9, so on and so forth. So that's how we come up with those test statistics, even if I kind of blank them out that 
you know, don't allow you to see the results that Excel gave us. Okay. And this kind of, I, one reason I, I want us to know how to do this is because it reiterates the fact that these are estimates, right? These are kind of like finding a sample mean. It's just, we're finding a sample like relationship between whatever X variable we're looking at and that Y variable. So um, that's how we would find a test statistic. What if I asked you for the interpretation of the coefficient on education? Right? So we look at education. Okay. So the coefficient on education is 1.23. So the way we interpret the X variable, this is kind of the general interpretation, is a one unit change in X causes the predicted Y variable to increase or if it's negative decrease by whatever that beta or whatever we want to call it b um, or that coefficient value is right? so for the education variable it would be what's our units in well our one unit change in education that x or that independent variable would be one more year of education causes the predicted y variable to increase by 1.23 and our y variable is in dollars per hour. So for every additional year of education, the expected wage or the predicted wage would go up by $1.23 per hour. Now experience and age would have similar interpretations because they're in the same unit. So one more year of education would increase the expected wage by one, sorry, every additional year of experience would increase the predicted wage by 0.41 dollars per hour or 41 cents per hour. For every additional year of age, every year older someone gets, the expected wage or the predicted wage goes down by what, 0.019 dollars or approximately two cents. Okay? So those have similar interpretations. What about this gender variable? Well, remember the gender variable is one if it was equal to male. So one thing that could help is I'm just gonna write in instead of gender here so we remember it's a one if the individual's male, zero if not. So if an individual was male, right, the predicted wage would increase. Right, a, a one unit change here is going from zero to one, female to male. So a male relative to the female, we would predict wages would be about two point two three dollars per hour higher. Okay. Now the only other thing that we can add, add on to this, this is the general interpretation if we only had one variable. So it's still the same interpretation, but we add on at the end, or we say at the beginning, holding everything else constant, everything else that we've included in the regression. So now the interpretation for the years of education is for every additional year of education, the predicted wage, hourly wage goes up by $1.23 per hour, holding everything else constant. Right? So holding everything else constant. Um, every additional year of education is correlated with a $1.23 increase in the hourly wage. Right? That's gonna be our interpretation of that coefficient. So anytime I'm asking for interpretations of coefficients, this is what I'm asking for. It's showing us that there's a correlation right, between education and our Y variable of wage, holding everything else in this uh, progression constant, and even more specifically, it's that every one additional year or one unit of that X variable is correlated with whatever the coefficient is, increase or decrease in our Y variable here being the hourly wage. Okay. Um, so we went through kind of the interpretations here. Now, one thing I could maybe also ask is, uh, let's add an additional question here. So we could call it question 11. Which of the independent variables in the regression are significant at the 5% level. Okay. So here we're thinking about is remember we've, we've got test statistics, which we could then obtain p values and determine whether or not we could reject or fail to reject the null. Now our null, this is a reminder, always starts out we assume that these coefficients are equal to zero. Right? That's our null hypothesis. Okay. What we're trying to find, test four, that alternative hypothesis, is that they're anything, I guess, not equal to zero, just so I don't have to kind of find the symbol. Right? I guess here, I'll be able to put in a little bit of extra work here. So we'll go insert symbol not equals, okay? 
So if we can find enough evidence that goes against this null, or we see a coefficient that is something other than zero, we can reject that null as long as the p-value is less than alpha. Well, at the 5% significance level, right, alpha would be 0 0.05. So we just go through, right, the p-value for education is below 0 0.05. The p-value for experience is below 0 0.05. So for those two variables, we can reject the null hypothesis, or we can reject that there's no relationship between education and experience and wage. Now, for age and gender here, we have p-values that are, are pretty high. In fact, for age, it's very high, right? And so for those two variables, we fail to reject the null, right? Because these p-values are not less than our alpha of 0 0.05. And when we say we fail to reject the null, if we fail to reject this, maybe if you want to think about it, it's not technically correct, but like assume it or uh, think about it as if we're accepting the null. What we're really saying is that slope coefficient right up here, B3 and B4, between age and wage and gender and wage, those are, we can't say those are anything different from zero. Okay. So the only significant variables we would have here is education and experience. Okay. Any questions on any of that? So the other thing that we might want to be able to interpret from this output is our R squared. So what we're really saying, so the R squared tells us the proportion of the variation in our Y variable that we're explaining with every variable that we've included. So here, 0.37 about. So the proportion of the variation we're explaining in, in wage is about 0.37, or we're explaining 37% of the variation in wage with all the variables that we've included. So there's still quite a bit left unaccounted for here, right? Almost 64 or 63-ish percent that we aren't explaining, which means there's probably some really important omitted variables out there. But this is all we had in, you know, maybe our data set. Okay. So that kind of covered, you know, is very, this is going to look something like you would see in the exam where I give you some regression output. I could ask you a few multiple choice questions here. I could, you know, turn these into short answer where I'm just simply asking, write down the interpretation, right? So make sure that, you know, you have a good enough understanding not to just choose from a multiple choice when I'm asking for the interpretation, but actually write out this more general form of the interpretation, but in the context, you know, know the general form of the, uh, of the interpretation, but be able to convert it into specific examples like we did here for wage and education. Okay. All right, so um, let's go to these additional questions that I posted today. So I think the first one is actually this, the, you know, first, the exact same thing that we just worked through. So we'll kind of skip through those. Um, I had an additional question in there, which we, we just kind of covered. Um, but let's go through this set of questions. Okay. So let's say we want to estimate the relationship between SAT scores and GPA. Okay. We run the following regression. We find estimates for the coefficients that are 1.5 and, and 0 0.002. Um, so what would the test statistic be for this SAT score slope coefficient, right? Well, if I'm thinking about the SAT score, right, let's zoom in here so we can see this a little bit better. I forget every time I switch files that it takes my view away. So if this is going to be 1.5, sorry, that's not 1.5, beta zero is 1.5. So we could think about almost, if we were trying to come up with the predicted GPA, I'm gonna change this to an equation, and I'm gonna throw a little prediction sign over it. So what we're really saying is that slope, or that intercept, sorry, coefficient is 1.5, plus the slope coefficient of 0 0.002 times the SAT score variable. This is how we could come up with predictions for what the GPA is for any SAT score. But here, in this first question, all we're asked for is, well, what's the test statistic on that slope coefficient we found of 0 0.002 for, for beta 1? Well, if we have the coefficient estimate, and here I'm giving you the standard errors, right? It's not in the, you know, not in the form of an Excel output here, but I'm just telling you the standard errors. All you have to do is take 0 0.002 divided by 0 0.0075, right? That was using this equation right here, giving us our test statistic, just take that slope coefficient and divide it by the standard error. Okay. 
So that one's pretty easy. So 0 0.002 divided by 0 0.0005. Think, uh, I don't this one, so. I think it's a 2.67. Whoops. There we go. So once again, these test statistic, test statistic questions should be pretty easy, some easier kind of points on the exam. What if I wanted to interpret um, the intercept coefficient. So we didn't do this in the last example, but the interpretation of the intercept is always if every variable we included on that right hand side, right, if every variable was zero, then the expected or the predicted value of our y variable would just be whatever that intercept coefficient is. Think about it here. If we plug in a zero for the SAT score, our intercept coefficient is the predicted GPA. Right? So if every x variable is zero, our intercept represents the kind of predicted value of our y variable. So here we look here, um, basically expected college GPA for a student earning a zero, yep, putting a zero in for our x variable, then the expected value for our y variable GPA would just be whatever that slope coefficient is. And that's always the interpretation. So if we go back up here to our other example, here it would be if every other variable that we included in on the right hand side was equal to zero, the expected hourly wage would be $8.68, right? And we kind of see that if I go back to when I typed out this equation, if everything's zero here, so if educate, years of education was zero, experience was zero, someone's age was zero, and then here there would be kind of female. Well, zero times anything is zero, so all of these just go away expected value of our wage would just be whatever that intercept value is. Okay. Now, these interpretations will be kind of weird. I mean, here you would say someone with zero years of education, zero years of experience, that their age is zero and they're female. I mean, a lot of the times these are hypotheticals, things that we actually wouldn't observe in the data, but that's still how we interpret the intercept. Okay. All right, so let's go down here where we leave off. Okay, so we're at question five. So if, what if we had a student with a 1200 SAT score? What would you expect or what would their predicted college GPA be? If we go back up to our equation, once we plugged in what those estimates were, really all you have to do is, well, if I want the expected GPA of someone with a 1200 SAT score, just plug in that 1200 SAT score, right? So if you then kind of, you know, end this in your calculator, so what, 0 0.002 times 1200 plus 1 1.5, we get, 3.9 here, okay? Now, one easy mistake you could make here is if you look at this and you simply take 1200 and multiply by 0 0.002, you'll get 2.4, but you forgot, you have to add in that intercept, right? So you're trying to come up with this prediction. The prediction includes the intercept and then plus every variable you include on the right-hand side times its, its coefficient estimate. Well, here we only had one variable, so that was kind of easy. So that's the predicted or the expected GPA for someone who scores a 1200 on the SAT score. Okay. Now, another question, I'm gonna add a question in here. So we'll call this uh, add a question. What is the expected increase in oops, a student's GPA if they score 100 points higher on the SAT score okay. or on the SAT? Well, here, if we go back up and we remember, well, what would the interpretation of beta one or our slope coefficient be? Well, it's the effect of a one unit increase in our X variable. So a one point increase on the SAT score would predict that college GPAs go up by 0 0.002. Well, if we know the effect of a one point increase and I want the effect of a hundred point increase, right? A hundred points higher. All I simply have to do is take that coefficient estimate and multiply, it's the effect of one unit, and then multiply it by whatever increase or decrease of units I, I want. So here I wanted 100 points higher, so simply 0 0.002 times 100, so I would get about a 0.2 increase in the predicted GPA. Maybe I wanna know, well, what about if they score, I don't know, let's say 200 points lower, right? Well, that would be a negative, Right, 200, right, 200 points lower would actually be going down by 200 units. 
So if this is the effect of one unit, and I'm going down by 200 units, right? I would get a negative 0.4, right? Predicted, right? 0.4 predicted decrease in, in, in GPA. So anytime I have the effect of one unit, I can just scale that to whatever units I'm interested in, in predicting kind of what the change in my SAT score, or sorry, in GPA would be from that increase, whatever, you know, number of units increase or decrease I want in the SAT score. Okay. Any questions on that one since I kind of added that question in there? All right. Then we're going to have this uh, more generalized. So assume that the test statistic on the SAT coefficient is 5.75, and that gives you a p-value of about zero. So a researcher suggests that, well, if we just make the SAT score easier, student scores will go up, and so will GPAs, right? Because our prediction is that one you know, unit increases or point increases in the SAT predict higher GPAs. Well, what's the problem with this logic? Well, I mean, this gets to the whole point that these are just evidences of correlations. It's, it's not necessarily that this is, you know, scoring higher on, you know, just having a higher SAT score is going to lead to higher GPAs. The reason why that correlation exists is because the SAT score and the and GPAs are reflections of someone's intellectual ability. So it's this kind of other thing that we're not really able to measure or throw into our regression here that's likely driving both of these. So here, the regression only provides evidence of a correlation. It's likely that intelligent students are going to score high on the SAT and get high GPAs, right? Excuse me, so this question is just getting at the, the idea that, well, look, we need to make sure we're not taking, you know, um, we're not uh, referencing these as causal relationships, but it's just evidence of correlation, okay? All right, so we'll move on to kind of the next example here. So let's say we wanna estimate, and this kind of looks something similar. Um, it's a little bit different, but this is kind of close to that fifth Excel assignment if you're working on that. It's kind of the same in the same vein. So let's say we want to estimate the relationship between a child's birth weight and then the mother's age, where birth weight is our dependent variable. We obtain 1,663 births and we run a simple linear regression. So one thing I might ask you to do, and this isn't a question here, but maybe like on a short answer, is write out the regression equation. Okay? And I've kind of used two forms and I don't care which one you, you would use. So I'll kind of do both of them here. So um, maybe I say, you know, I'm trying to predict kind of birth weight here using a mo the mother's age. So my, and I kind of even identified the birth weight is your dependent variable. So remember our dependent variable, that's the one we're trying to predict. That's our Y variable. So our left-hand side variable here, our Y variable is birth weight. We're trying to predict it, right? So we'll include our intercept plus our slope coefficient times that x variable, which we had was mother's age. Okay. Now, the other form that you could write this in, and I'm just going to copy and paste this so I don't have to kind of go through all the... Uh... And here, if we want to be real technical, I should be including kind of this epsilon, right? Because, oops, that actually should be part of it, but I'm not, when it comes to kind of grading, I, I, I won't, if you forget to kind of add that in, if I ask this type of a question, I'm not going to kind of penalize you for getting that there is an error term that exists. This is the equation you're trying to estimate. You don't have the estimates yet. So that error term still exists, but I, I'm not going to kind of grade on that if I asked you a question like this on the exam. So here, the other form that I could write this out as, you know, birth weight is my Y variable. mother's age is my X variable. Instead of using kind of A and then B, I could just write these as beta zero and beta one, right? These are two forms that we've seen. This. So either one is acceptable, right? It's just notation here. Okay. So assume, and if I write this out, even if I didn't ask the question, it kind of helps me visualize what's going on. Right? So assume the intercept coefficient you found was 3,524, right? So if we think about once we estimate this equation, right, we aren't able to kind of build in these epsilons. And if we were trying to predict birth weight using this, some output we find for the intercept and for the slope coefficient, if that intercept coefficient is 3,524, how do we interpret that? Well, remember the interpretation of the intercept 
is always just if our x variables are equal to zero, this is the predicted value of y. Well, here it's a little bit goofy, but it would be a mother who is zero years of age, right? Then the predicted, if a mother of zero years of age had a child, the predicted birth would be 3,500. Now, like I said, these intercept interpretations can sometimes be kind of goofy, um, but that's still how we interpret it. And the reason why is if we think about um, what we're doing here with the simple linear regression, so we had kind of mother's age here and then uh, birth weights. It's likely, so I think, you know, we had a positive intercept and then there's some positive relate, or sorry, actually, my guess is, we're thinking about the actual variables we're using. I'm guessing with age, right? Mother's age, as some weeks older, the kind of complicates pregnancy, birth weight might go down. So the thing is, we have a positive intercept here when mother's age is zero, but in the data, right, if we think about where would the data actually be, the data is probably up here, right? We never actually observe births to someone who's zero years of age. So that's why the interpretation is just kind of a little bit clunky. But that's still, that's still how we, were, we, uh, we interpret it. Okay. So there, um, the expected birth weight for a mother who is zero would be whatever that intercept coefficient is. So when the mother is zero, the intercept coefficient is the expected birth weight. Um, here we have another question, expect, you know, suppose that the test statistic is you find um, for the slope coefficient on mother's age is 2.54. So let's say we have obtain some value for beta one and we've turned it into a test statistic and it's 2.54, right? The researcher concludes that as a mother gets older, her child will have a, a higher birth weight. But what's the problem with this logic? Right? Well, I just kind of drew out what I believe the relationship is. The actual relationship is likely that, that it's negative. So why is this a, a positive value? Well, remember, this is only evidence of a correlation. We probably left off really, you know, a lot of other important variables that help predict birth weight. And if any of those other variables are correlated with the mother's age, then beta one, remember, oh, I don't think, it, it's not on the formula sheet, but I, uh, we, we looked at it on the slides quite a bit where there's gonna be this additional bias component. This additional component that biases our estimate for beta one. So we have to remember this is just evidence of a correlation, right? It's likely that as a mother gets older, there's other things like how much education she has, um, higher income that are going to, um, th that are all things that are correlated with the mother's age that would actually improve kind of the birth outcome or improve birth weights, right? So this is just evidence of a correlation, right? Could be that there's other factors that we didn't include that are correlated with the mother's age that would kind of improve improve birth weights there. Okay. So anytime I'm kind of asking questions like this, really go back to this idea of the difference between correlation and causation, that these are just, these estimates are just evidence of a correlation. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a, a different example, I've seen a couple of different you know, similar types of, of questions. Something I wanted to add in here is, um, let's think about um, if I were to tell you, similar to the last example, assume that you find that the estimate for beta one, really if I wanted to be technical here, I should put a hat a little bit beta, but, but kind of bear with me. So let's say it's, uh, I guess I can do it here. Um, there we go. Assume that the coefficient estimate you find is, I don't know, let's say I, I did assume that it was like 2.54, right? That's kind of, I think, the value that we had below. Okay. How would I interpret that slope coefficient? What would be for every additional year that someone is older, a mother, you know, every additional year a mother is older, the predicted birth weight of the child would go up by 2.54. And here, that y variable we had um, was measured in grams. Right? We've, we've seen this, this example a lot, and I've talked about this data set, so hopefully we're, we're comfortable with this birth weight is in grams. Right? Um, you could then, then do very similar things. Well, what if the mother is five years older? Well, the effect of, um, the effect of a mother being five years older, well, if you know the effect of being one year older is 2.54, you simply scale that by whatever units you're interested in. You're interested in five years older, not just one year older, so five times that, right? 
And, you know, similar to the last example, we could play around with, you know, what if they're 10 years younger? Well, then this would be 10 years younger. Well, if the effect of being a year older is 2.54, and the effect of being 10 years younger, we would multiply that by negative 10. All right, so one more kind of example and a few questions I think will actually, is it one more example? Yeah, we got two in here. So I don't know if we'll get through both of them, but we might. So we talked about this example a little bit in class, um, but let's assume, right, that I'm trying to predict kind of poverty, or sorry, uh, crime rates. And this is uh, kind of the, the amount of property crimes per 100,000 people. And my independent variable is police force expenditures. So really what I'm thinking about, and I also include the unemployment rate. So what I'm thinking about here is, trying to predict crime rates, right, using independent variables of expenditures and unemployment rate. Okay. So we run this linear regression in Excel and I get this output. Right. Now, I didn't show you the test statistics here. Once again, there's just a box over them so you can move it if you want to when you have the file open. But how would I find, right, this is kind of some maybe sample, some short answer stuff here and not multiple choice. Now, one of the questions I didn't ask here is what, how would I find the test statistics? Well, remember, it's as simple as dividing the coefficients by the standard error. So here, 12.6 divided by 2.35 would give you that test statistic of 5.37. Another thing to kind of mention, because I wasn't showing you the p-values here, if you were, this is an example where I left this off and I asked you, which of these variables that I've included, ex excluding the intercept, could I reject the null hypothesis at, or for? Well, if I look at my p-values, we have to remember if we see 2.2 e to the negative six, let's move that decimal point six places to the left. So it would actually be what, 0.000022? So that's a pretty much a p-value of zero. So that's gonna be less than any alpha. It doesn't matter what level of significance I ask you, you know, the, the one, the five, or the 10%, that's gonna be less than all of them. And so I can reject the null here, which is that the null is that there's no relationship between police force expenditures and crime rates. Using that p-value, I can reject that. But what about this unemployment rate, right? Well, it's a p-value of 0.95. So this isn't, and it can be, and we're close to being less than my alphas of 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0.1. So I fail to reject the null here. Or really what I'm saying is I didn't find enough evidence to say that there's any relationship between the unemployment rate and crime rates. Okay. How would I interpret this police expenditures coefficient? Well, if I go back up here, the police force expenditures was measured in dollars per person. Right? So if I spend one more dollar per person, right, that's a one unit increase in my police force expenditures, then the predicted crime rates would go down by 12.6. So one unit change here, so if I spend one more dollar per person, that's my one unit increase, then the predicted change in my Y variable, which was crime rates, would be whatever that coefficient estimate was, which is about 12.6, holding all else constant, right? Now here, all else is just the unemployment rate, but, but still holding everything else in this regression constant, okay? Any questions on, on any of this before we keep moving? All right, what would the interpretation for the intercept be here? Well, once again, the interpretation of the intercept is if every variable in this regression was equal to zero, the intercept would be the predicted value of our Y variable. So if we spent zero dollars per person on the police force, we had an unemployment rate of zero, the expected crimes per person would be about 3,230. So if we spent zero dollars per person and the unemployment rate, was also zero. The predicted crime rate would be, what was that, 3,230? Okay. So once again, are we actually ever gonna observe a zero? You know, so a county or a state where they're spending zero dollars per person where they have unemployment, rate, unemployment rates of zero? Probably not. But that's still how we, we 
interpret that, that intercept. All right, we already kind of covered how we would find these test statistics. I think that's that's relatively easy. Like I said, those should be some easy points in the exam. And we already, the additional thing we kind of discussed we had was, can we reject or fail to reject the null here? Um, here we have 14 minutes left. How many questions do I have here? Just a few. I think I want to save this so we have something to kind of kind of work through on on Monday. Um, sorry, on Monday. On Friday. Uh, are there any other questions specific on any of the the practice exams um, that you guys had? Okay. Um, probably have a shorter class, and I I will go over one more thing before we we end here which is just kind of giving you maybe something that might help um, on that fifth and final Excel. So oh, it's a CSV file, I think I'll let it go. Uh, I got the file somewhere else. I think it's kind of interesting. So, did I erase it already? That's not good. Here. Um, I think this is the one. There we go. Um, so, one thing that we could have some problems with. Uh, let's say, so I was actually interested in this the other day, and I'm kind of currently working on a project. So I'm gonna filter this data here real quick so I can look at some things here. So let's say um, I got kind of interested in like trying to make some money on sports betting. So one thing that they, they do in sports betting is you can kind of bet over unders, right? So how many points are gonna be scored in a game? Uh, let me see, make sure this one all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. So one thing you could do right, is if I had this total point scored variable, I'm just going to delete this because this isn't important for what we're doing right now. And I then had some kind of like what the temperature was, what the wind, what the humidity was. I was kind of think, you know, kind of interested in, can I predict kind of what the total point score in the game will be based off of what the weather conditions were, right? And this is, I believe, NFL football. So if I go to data, um, use this data analysis tool, which Hopefully, if you're planning on doing that fifth Excel assignment, you've, you've already worked on getting that added into your, your Excel. I come down here to regression, I hit OK. Say my Y variable, I want to try to predict total points. Oh, I've got the weird ones down here. These are games that hadn't been played yet that they already had in. So let me go, just select total points. And then I go here to my X variable. And let's say I just include temperature. Shoot, there's blanks. So this is actually something good we can talk about. And this won't apply to your specific assignment, but a lot of times if we have blanks in a data set, I can't use that observation. So one way to get rid of them is once you have this data filter and you click on these blanks, now I'll just control shift down arrow, delete all those. Might take a second. We'll then get go back. I want to see all these. Now, when I go to data analysis, I shouldn't run into the same issue. So now my Y variable, I still want to try to predict total points. My X variable. I want to do temperature. I selected the labels. And I've got an issue, right? So I need the same number of rows. So there's an issue kind of in my, my data, all right? So a lot of times we'll get these errors. Now, what do I want to do here? Guessing it's in the total points. No, it's not. I really wanted to show you this example here real quick, and I, I thought I had the, the clean version of the data. So let's go down here and see what's going on. Uh, I think it might not like these. These are games that haven't been played yet. Okay. So that should be okay. So now we go to data data analysis, regression. 
So total points. Okay, that goes to, oh, I see what happened. So then we'll go to weather. Now we've got the same, there we go. Now we should be good. All right. So we can kind of predict kind of the total points in the game by the temperature. So if the temperature is higher, it looks here like that more points will be scored. But one problem you might run into, and let me make sure that there's, get rid of all my zeros here. So I can't use these. So get rid of the percents because I can't do anything with those. Can't do anything with the blanks. So just let me delete these here real quick so I can show you the problem that you might run into. Come on, Excel. Work a little bit faster for me here. I'll break Excel. There we go. So I'll select all. So now let's say I want to include the humidity and temperature. Right? So I go to data, data analysis, hit my regression, reselect my Y variable, which is total points, select my X variables. So let's say I want to include temperature and this humidity. So I'll select both of those. Whoops. I'll select temperature, come up here, hold control, and then select humidity. If I try to run this regression, it gives me this contiguous reference. So I had some, a couple people email me about this. I believe it's in problem one. I asked you to include only a couple of the variables, and if you try, it's not going to work. So the problem is it can only run this regression if the variables that you're including on the right-hand side or your X variables are right next to each other. So all you have to do, select on this one that we didn't want, which was wind, move this over, move my humidity variable next to the temperature variable, and then I can kind of move this back over as well. Now, when I go to that data analysis and I select my X variables, well, now they're right next to each other, humidity and temperature, I can select them. Now I can run that regression, right? So we've got temperature and humidity. So for that first problem of the Excel assignment, you're gonna to have to move those columns around, right? Kind of like I just did. And sorry, I had to clean some of this data up, but you know, it kind of shows you that a lot of times you'll get a data set and it's got observations that aren't usable for what you wanna do. I can't use an observation if it has missing values for the temperature or humidity here. So I had to kind of go through, use that filter tool to get rid of those, um, rid of those original, uh, you know, those blank, blank observations. And that kind of also allowed us to look at, kind of address that contiguous cell reference error. It's really just a matter of moving around those columns, right? Clicking on the column and moving it around. So you get the variables that you want to include on the right-hand side, all right next to each other. Okay. All right, um, that should be it uh, for today. Uh, we've got a little bit more of those additional kind of problems to go through on Friday, but Friday will probably be a pretty quick, quick class unless you come with specific questions. So I think of Friday more as like, yeah, I'll go over a little bit of more review of those additional problems we had, but also just a time for you kind of like office hours. If you want to come and ask questions, uh, that'll be a, a good time to do that. Uh, Monday, I'll be doing the same thing. I won't be doing additional review problems unless people that kind of sign on Monday have specific questions for me. So it'd be more like office hours on Monday as well. You can kind of show up and ask, you know, what about, the, or even it doesn't have to, you know, won't be a homework question at that, at, point, at that point, but it'll be, you know, I've been working through these practice exams or looking at this question, I can't figure out what's going on. Um, you kind of bring those questions on Monday as well. Okay. Uh, also, I'll put an announcement up about the exam today. Um, it's pretty much finalized, um, at least in terms of, uh, I have a number of, I have the questions all kind of written. I have the number of, of short answer and the number of um, multiple choice and kind of the breakdown of points. So I'll put up an explanation, you know, a little announcement about all of that today uh, up on Canvas. So you kind of know what to expect kind of going to that final. Any other questions for me before we get out of here today? Okay. All right. So Friday, very quick kind of review of those additional questions. And then from there, just you bring specific questions if you want to show up there on, on Friday. All right. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, um, remind you guys, and I might put an announcement cameras for this as well. If you haven't, if you can fill out those, um, 
student you know, teacher evaluations, I'm sure you're getting inundated with emails for, because I know I, I get updates on them all the time, um, remind, you know, telling me that how many of you and to remind you to remind you. So um, I'm doing my due diligence there. If you take a little bit of time to, to go on and, and kind of do that, I'd greatly appreciate it. it. Helps out me, helps out the department, helps out the College of Business um, and the university. Okay. All right, I will see you guys on Friday.